haven't talked since COVID. And since then, Sierra's given birth, and there's been a, a whole bunch of people which, with a mask on. And I'm wondering how mm-hmm. that has impacted childbirth uh, with COVID being such a, you know, a incurable virus. Yeah, I mean, it's changed a lot of things for people. I think, um, you know, the first thing was um, the limited support, right? So you go in, you think you're going to have your partner, you think family members are coming, and um, that stops, right? And so immediately um, we had to sort of adjust how care looked like, but also when you think about the birthing process, you think about having your partner there or a family member, doula, and they had um, eliminated doula support. In New York wow. City, it started back, so now you can have your doulas present in most in most hospitals, but it's very state by state, and also it's going to vary based on um, the numbers, right? So everything's really precarious, and it's going to be based on, um, you know, what the CDC puts out and, and really public health first. But um, the reason in the beginning was because we didn't have enough PPE for people. They didn't have it for the hospital, you know, folks and the care providers, and then certainly they didn't have extra for um, if you wanted to bring your doula present, right? So um, that was a real challenge in the beginning and making sure people had not only the um, an understanding how to navigate that process, but also advocacy tools to navigate, especially in a time of, of a pandemic. It's a totally different experience. So how did that change your, your business? Well, I think for us, a lot of things went virtual, right? So um, immediately we were able to use the tools like Zoom and FaceTime and you know, whereby and all these things that are at our fingertips with technology to continue to talk to patients, right? So a lot of our clients either did education, you know, virtually. So a lot of the stuff that you would do in person with them ended up being online. Um, A lot of people and and hospitals too sort of figured out uh, how to bend rules a little bit. Because many times if you want to film, you can't film in the hospital at, at the time of birth. So you can take still pictures. They actually eliminated that rule in many places to where you could have, um, you could do like FaceTime or Zoom for that duration of the process, right? So if you were in active labor, your doula could be on FaceTime with you during active labor to get through that. Now, it's not the same as having someone in the room. But um, many hospitals accommodated for that just to sort of, um, you know, make broadband a, a thing for, for actual clients, which it wasn't really. Usually you can't get on the hospital network to get online, you know, when you're for a delivery. So those kind of things were accommodated for to make up for the fact that people couldn't have the folks they wanted in the room. But um, it definitely affected things in the beginning, but now people have kind of adjusted, right, a little bit to the virtual life. So a lot of care is, is moving in this, in this way, including um, visits that people have with their providers. A lot of that care has shifted to um, telehealth. So people are used to now, like, visiting their doctor online, um, which I'm not 100% on board with because we have a lot of critical um, points within the birth process and the pregnancy um, continuum where we need to get screened, right? We need somebody to lay eyes on us. We need, like, um, you know, diagnostics checked and stuff so um, that's one thing that I think we really need to, to really be, um, you know, a little bit more, I don't know, judicious about, you know, we really do need to bring people into the hospital and to their, to see their providers. But in some cases it is okay to, to do a lot of the virtual stuff. And so for the non-clinical stuff that we do, which is more emotionally based and education based, virtual can work better. In this nice. Time. Nice. I had a couple questions for you. Um, so just two parts. A, you know, I'm asking this because I'm pretty sure there are a number of people in the audience who are pregnant right now, listening, or are planning to get pregnant, or engaging in activities that may lead to pregnancy. Right? Sure. Lots of that. Yeah. Yeah, there are lots of that going on. So question number one, um, you did mention that, uh, you didn't mention the hospitals a lot. Are birthing centers available as an option for people who are interested in that, right? So they are available. And B, what are the typical questions that you're getting from your patients and clients? Like what what are the kind of things that people are asking repeatedly or confused about? And, you know, that the kind of stuff that uh, people listening in the audience would want to know. Yeah. So I think um, one of the first things I would say is, um, you know, this country has built systems against midwifery. So in a time like like this where we're in a real crisis where we need 
um, caregiving models that are out of hospital, that are more ancestral, um, we don't have that to fall back on, right? Because um, the way that we fashioned um, medicine, it's been about um, insurance, it's been about making money, it's not been about like patient-centric care. And so if you see where it evolved from, which was centered around um, really uh, African women providing um, this type of care um, during chattel slavery, not only for each other, but for, you know, the slave master's children um, and in wet nursing as well. We're actually in um, Black Breastfeeding Week right now. Um, that's where we evolved from, right? And so, and that care was super patient-centric. It was super um, centered on that person and, and their unique needs. And the way medicine works, um, it's really like everything is like an antagonist to like the process that, that unfolds, right? What you need to like actually move through that process smoothly, we don't actually provide you with those tools in, in our current medical model. So what that means is that someone who's coming in in a time of COVID, in a time of crisis, um, what are some things they're, they're saddled with? Anxiety, right? All of us are sort of anxious. There's things happening in the news cycle. What does anxiety lead to? Um, it, it, co it compounds stress, right? So if you have existential stress connected to uh, being furloughed, losing your job, being in the house with people for four months straight, right? Um, you know, being food insecure, housing insecure, these, these, and job insecure, these kind of things will impact your health because it actually contributes to chronic stress. And chronic stress leads to comorbidities that we see show up in the birth process. So what does that look like for black and brown individuals? Well, we see that for black people, there's, um, it could be asthma, right, that we already were, you know, we think about environmental factors, asthma. Um, hypertension shows up a lot, right, in pregnancy. And people really equate it to food, but it's really equated to stress, right, stress management. Mm -hmm. And so then you have hypertension, which is, a direct result of the time that we're living in, right? Being being anxious, being stressed, not being able to like up, um, off board that stress. So then you have that that you're carrying. Then you can have a placental disorder or a blood disorder. Um, you might possibly have a, um, you know, gestational diabetes, right? Um, so there's all kinds of factors that show up, but what what's what we don't ever think about is the factors that are working on you before you even get pregnant, right? And so there are fa systemic factors that are working on people before they're even pregnant and that exacerbate these health outcomes, right? And that, when we're talking about people of color, we are talking about forces like white supremacy. We're talking about racism. We're talking about um, poverty, right? Um, we're talking about redlining. We're talking about, um, you know, um, what we call not just like food deserts, but maternity deserts, where you can be in a county where you don't have access to a care provider, right? So I think that people, if I can speak across the board, I think that all of those things touch someone, right? So um, in this time, what I would say is out of hospital birth is certainly something that she, people should look into if it's within their purview. So in terms of insurance provision, in terms of what they have access to, in terms of care providers as well. So looking to see who's local, if you can work with a midwife, if you can work um, with a midwife who's in a hospital or a midwife who's at a birth center or um, for home birth, right? These are options that are available to us, especially if we have low-risk birth. When we're talking about low-risk, it means that we don't have to be managed, um, our care doesn't be managed by um, the hospital or the doctor. That's really important. And many people are low risk and don't realize it, right, because they're not getting, like, quality care. So I think that um, that's a big thing to think about. So let's say, for example, um, Karen Hunter was pregnant in the time of COVID. <laughs> She's going in and getting ready to give birth. What is happening that's different now than this time last year? You know, yeah. from intake to delivery to getting out of the hospital. And then after that, touch on the breastfeeding. And we want to go, go into uh, the breastfeeding. But what's the difference yeah. this year? Yeah, I love year? I love Karen's eye roll about the pregnancy that you just threw onto her. <laughs> I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> so, um, so, so here it is, right? So, so before you would just, um, 
you know, obviously we're not wearing masks. You would have gone into the hospital freely, you know, a year ago. And today you would, um, if you anticipated that you were in labor, um, the protocol is still to stay home as long as possible, right? So really don't go until you're in active labor, um, obviously, unless you've created a different plan with your doctor. Um, that minimizes risk, but it also means that you'll have less time inside the hospital, less opportunity for any sort of obstetrical interventions. Um, so when you get there, right, if you're going with by yourself, if you're going with, um, you know, a partner or a family member, uh, you show up, you get screened, right? So before you even enter into the building, there's a screening. They're going to do a respiratory screening, and they'll do a temperature check. Um, it depends on the, the hospital. It depends on what they have available in terms of testing kits. Um, you may do, like, a, a swab test um, also. And then if you don't come, if that test does not come back, um, like, if you have a, if somebody with you, including yourself, has a fever, you go directly to an isolation unit. And if wow. your partner has a fever, they cannot come. They can come three days later, but guess what? They probably here by then, right? But they cannot come. And so that's one big difference. So the screening protocol is in place for every hospital. Um, once you get upstairs to the like room delivery floor, uh, a couple of things are different. This is going to depend on the unit that you're in and the in the hospital as well as by state. But ain't no running through the halls, no hanging out, no like oh I'm going to go and get my pee. No, you're in the room, right? When you're in the room, everybody is in PPE. Um, wow. and that's pretty much the whole time. So the, in some hospitals, they're allowing you to like walk, like into the hallway, like say you want to get a sip of water, or go get a coffee, obviously masked up and you have to go directly back into your room. You cannot like hang out and walk through the halls or, or be in the waiting rooms and things like that. That's not happening anymore. So the sort of, um, support that we anticipate going into this is completely changed, Right. And so for people of color who, you know, when we show up, like if somebody's having a baby or somebody's in the hospital and we say, I'm on my way, that means we on our way, it's 10 <laughs> of us, right, showing up to the hospital, that's, those days are not, you know, those days are kind of over for now, right? So you come with one person and that's the person you can come with. And in some cases, you can come with that person and your doula. So that's what it looks like for now. And then I would say when it's time to discharge, then, you know, the same thing, like you have your car seat, everything, they let you leave. Um, but, again, you're, like, masked up until you go. And um, What do you do for they, the baby? Uh, the, baby, like the baby, what do you mean? No, the baby's not masked. Like the baby's baby covered. Okay. Drake. So yeah, China, Drake, not, China has yeah. for, uh, shields for babies. The, uh, I saw yeah, a bunch a of, they have a whole sh little baby shield over every single baby that has yeah. been born during COVID-19. And I think there's going to be a lot of babies born in December, November, and January. <laughs> yeah. uh, and February and March and April. <laughs> probably, yes. Okay.